introduce our next speaker, uh, Peter Lodal from the Niels Bohr Institute. Uh, we'll be talking about topic of quantum dots to photonic crystal events. Yes, thank you very much, Derek. Yeah, I will uh, be continuing along the lines of two previous talks. So there's been ex excellent introduction to what uh, I will be talking about. I will do quantum optics in one-dimensional directional photonic reservoirs. I'm coming from the Niels Bohr Institute, University of Copenhagen, where I'm heading the quantum photonics group. And um, I'll be, well, the general introduction to what this is about, I uh, hardly have to mention this audience, but we want to construct photonic quantum networks. Of course, we have our heroes from the atomic physics community. We have them in the U.S. and in, in Europe. And uh, they have been uh, doing cavity QED experiments for, for years and thinking about wiring up uh, quantum nodes into large-scale quantum networks. And uh, we want to do it all to the state. So it's, uh, again, quantum dots embedded in photonic crystal nanostructures. And I think it's quite exciting times for, for our field, for our community. I think we have been, uh, well, solving child diseases, curing child diseases for years because, I mean, this is solid state. So one has to worry about decoherence processes. And many solid state systems are not coherent at all. It's embedded in a solid. And this solid will vibrate due to phonons and whatnot. And, I mean, we're really starting to, to solve these issues. And we have heard beautiful uh, progress along these lines already from Ido and, and Kai. And um, so we have been developing puzzle pieces over the years, I would say, and, and I will discuss some of these puzzle pieces today. And I think we are, as a community, now starting to ask the question, so how do we scale? How do we put these puzzle pieces together into large-scale quantum architectures and do something interesting there? So I'll be talking about efficient single photon sources. I'll also be saying something about nonlinearity, some recent work we have there. Of course, also has been mentioned already for uh, superconducting uh, detectors can be naturally um, uh, 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 embedded on these structures or incorporated in these structures, so we can do everything on chip. We can do processing of photons, also making photonic circuits for that. We can also have long-range interaction, dipole-dipole interaction, because we can make nice 1D systems. And we can also cobble the photons out from the photonic crystal structures by making tapers and cobbling into fiber and propagating photons over long distances. And uh, for, for kind of the details of, of, of the, where the field is at the moment, uh, I'll refer you to this uh, review paper that came out in Review Modern Physics uh, just about a month ago. So the outline of the talk is I'll say something about photonic crystal, local light matter interaction of photonic crystals. I'll talk about deterministic and directional single photon emission that we can achieve in these structures. I'll talk about single photon nonlinear optics and say something about quantum information processing and the prospects for quantum information processing based on these systems. So, um, photonic crystals are these periodic dielectric structures we've heard about. Uh, we have two-dimensional photonic crystals made by electron beam lithography and, and your etching, and we create a 2D structure, and we, we make a membrane, so we remove the uh, sacrificial layer underneath, so we get a 150 nanometer thin gallium arsenide membrane, where we have a single layer of quantum dots inside. And so the cartoon density of states that you would have in such a structure sketched here, there would be a band gap, range of frequencies where the density of states is strongly suppressed. It's an interesting question how much, and I'll answer that in a question because in, in a minute, because this is really the name of the game of photonic crystals. You can suppress leakage to all unwanted mode, and then you can enhance the coupling into your cavity or the waveguide. So this is really the secret weapon of photonic crystals. But how much can I control spontaneous emission? How much can I suppress spontaneous emission? Well, that's linked to what's called the local density of states. Its mathematical definition is up here. In wigner weisskopf theory, it's directly proportional to the radiative decay rate. So if I have a quantum emitter, I place it inside the structure, I measure its rate, and it's in the wigner weisskopf approximation, so it's a Markovian uh, light matter interaction, and this is usually the case uh, unless you are close to band edges and things like that. Well, then you just measure this rate and you can probe the local density of states, but you need to make sure that, you know, there will be non-radiative processes, so there's, uh, you really need to know your emitter well, in, uh, very well in order to be able to probe just the radiative part. So we have done quite some ex extensive works along these lines. Uh, I'll not go through the details here, but really, I mean, studying quantum dots and known photonic nanostructures where, that we can use to really learn how you probe the radiative decay rate. If you measure or calculate the local density of state here, you see the spatial map of the inhibition factor in the band gap region for an X-oriented dipole and a Y-oriented dipole, and it really promises that you can suppress spontaneous emission by factor 
up to 160, and it's really at many different spatial positions. And this is because I have a 2D band gap, but I have the membrane, so I have total internal reflection at the gallium arsenide air interface, and this is really sufficiently, this combination is really sufficiently efficient that I can suppress spontaneous emission that much. What doesn't work in experiment, um, well, there, those are man-made structures, but there will be fabrication imperfections and, and so on. So here's, uh, we have actually measured this local density of state by looking at, at measuring this radiative decay rate of single quantum dots. You are then probing the frequency dependence of the local density of states, and uh, um, so we are varying the lattice constant of the photonic crystal and getting the frequency map of the local density of states. And the numbers here, it's a, it's a logarithmic scale, so you really see suppression of up to a factor of 70 of inhibition of spontaneous emission these structures. So it's, say, within a close to a factor of two of what theory expects. And this is really good news because uh, that means that this suppression of leakage to all unwanted modes is really a, a very, very robust effect. It's spatially robust. It's also spectrally very robust, and it's also robust to fabrication imperfection. So it's really something that is very... Uh, robust to, to extend on. So what we can then do is to, of course, introduce waveguides and cavities in these structures. Um, so it's very easy. You leave out a row of holes that creates a photonic crystal waveguide, and then we can embed single quantum knots in these waveguides. And uh, that can be used really as an extremely efficient single photon source, and the figure of merit is the beta factor, the rate of coupling into the waveguide relative to the total emission rate uh, of the quantum knot, it can leak out of the structure due to the coupling to these non-guided modes. But those were the ones that I could suppress very much by the band gap, by this factor of 70 I was talking about. There will also be some kind of non-radiative processes inside the quantum knot. I excite the quantum knot, but it doesn't necessarily emit a single photon. The, the excitation could go somewhere else. Uh, but I can also enhance the coupling into the waveguide mode. But that's because um, these waveguide modes are strongly dispersive. So here you see the dispersion diagram of, uh, of the photonic band gap structure. You have a, a band gap region where that's in between those two lines here. And in this band gap, I start to introduce modes. And that's a waveguide modes that are guided along the waveguide, that are propagating modes along the waveguide. But they're very dispersive. So if I calculate the group velocity, the omega decay, well, it will go to zero, ideally, here, at the frequency at the cutoff of the band gap of, of, the, of the mode here. So I can slow down light, and thereby I can also enhance the coupling into the mode because the density of states of this waveguide mode is inversely proportional to the group velocity. However, uh, there's a limit to how well I can do that because this slowing down of light is very sensitive to fabrication imperfections. So that means in practice what I can do is slowing down light, typical factor of 60 we'll see in the, in the lab, maybe up to a factor of 100. Uh, but if I calculate then the expected beta factor, so the spatial map of this beta factor, you can see it over here for these realistic slowdown factors of, say, 58, you will see, that, well, the expected beta factor is close to ideal. So the numbers are 99.8% efficiency. And it's really spatially robust at many different spatial positions inside the waveguide. So the nanostructure is almost perfect. And even uh, when I'm not using slow light for a group index or slowdown factor of 5, I will still have a beta factor, expect a beta factor above 98%. And the reason for that is really that I'm very much relying on the suppression of coupling to uh, leaky modes uh, to enhance uh, this beta factor. So to the experimental demonstration of this beta factor, um, well, what you do is that you are measuring the rate of these quantum dots. So you look for well-coupled quantum dots, and you see quantum dots that decay with rates up to six or seven inverse nanoseconds, and then you're searching for quantum dots that are not well coupled. Uh, it's actually not so easy to, to, to measure a beta factor very close to one. Uh, so, so um, but you're, you're, you're looking for the weakest coupling, coupled quantum dots, and uh, we see quantum dots that have decay rates that are slower than 0.1 inverse nanoseconds, and then you compare that to the best coupled quantum dots, and then you want to make sure that this is a fair comparison because you're looking at quantum dots that are sitting, sitting at different positions, uh, and, and, but but if actually from their rates and the known local density of states, you, know, you can narrow down quite well what spatial position they might sit at. So we can actually, from that, get a lower bound of the beta factor, which is 98.4%, which corresponds to a cooperativity of 62, uh, at least. So, so this, this works pretty well. And it's not just one quantum knot that has a high cooperativity and beta factor. Here's the statistics of, of, I think, 70 different quantum dots. 
uh, and you see the beta factor for as a function of wavelengths. This is the cutoff of the waveguide mode, and you see, that, so this is a slow light regime where you have this beta factor of 98%, but it also ranges out far away from the band edge, again, because it's, so it's spectrally extremely broad, because uh, it doesn't necessarily require the slow light. And here we are comparing two different outcoupling strategies. You can make all these kind of of, of, of nice uh, gradings, for instance, that couples the light vertically out of structure. You can also make uh, uh, tapers so that you can collect the light from the from the side of the waveguide, and and you can make all kinds of of designs here. Uh, and those are by now also quite outdated uh, uh, designs. So, so you can really uh, it's a, it's really an imp impedance matching task to take the light from inside the waveguide and then couple it off chip for, for efficient detection it was mentioned in the previous talk also I mean uh, th this is just an engineering task where if you're sufficiently serious about <laughs> solving Maxwell's equation first to engineer a structure that accommodates and propagates the light uh, well out of the structure and then of course making it uh, come up with a design that you can fabricate and that is tolerant to fabrication imperfections and so on and we have all kinds of ingenious designs for doing that something that we're working harder than the moment so the intrinsic quantum efficiency of beta factors is 98.4 percent but of course uh, copying them off chip is another issue and there will also be questions about so once i have excited the quantum dot how sure can i be that it emits a single photon is it really a source that emits a single photon every single time that i excite it and uh, not necessarily but this is uh, where i mean people in the field really have demonstrated that well you can have all kinds of blinking processes the quantum light can go dark for a certain period of time if it if it traps an additional charge for instance or a charge uh, uh, escapes from the quantum dot and you want to avoid these processes if you really want this dream source here that emits a single photon every single time i trigger it uh, but this can be solved i think putting gates on the structures has really uh, shown to 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 be uh, a key to doing that. I mean, el putting electrical gates where you're stabilizing the electron hole pair inside the quantum dot, um, and um, and while well, doing resonant excitation. I mean, things like that really have 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 solved these issues. Well, this is just a, a sort of a figure for, from our review paper uh, explaining these different approaches to one D. Uh, nanophotonic systems that are becoming quite popular and this, what this workshop is about also. We have these photonic crystal waveguides that we're talking about here. We also have dielectric nanowires, uh, pioneered particularly by uh, Jean-Michel Girard in Grenoble. And we also have plasmonic nanowires uh, that have also been proposed here at, at Howard. And uh, you can say uh, that photonic nanowires exploit suppression of coupling to radiation modes. Plasmonic nanowires enhance the coupling into uh, the plasma nanowire in this case, uh, photonic crystal waveguides do, the, do both effects at the same time, so you suppress and you enhance. Uh, and this is kind of the status of the numbers uh, for the various systems. But uh, we can do more than, of course, uh, generating single photons, and uh, you can also exploit this very high cooperativity and this high beta factor to do single photon linearity. And this has pretty much been... Uh, proposed by the audience here, so I, I hardly have to explain it. If I, uh, we were talking a lot about it uh, also in the, in the morning session from uh, uh, about the superconducting qubits, and it's almost a little bit embarrassing or certainly uh, uh, a challenge to speak about the optical experiments here after uh, these fantastic results that we have been seeing in the morning. Uh, we're not quite there yet, um, but actually the potential is there, and uh, because the coupling efficiencies, the cooperativities that I'm talking about is actually uh, pretty good. Uh, so the idea is you launch single photons, and a single photon will be reflected with beta squared probability, uh, unity probability beta is one, um, and two and higher photon components will have an increased probability to be transmitted. However, it's more than just beta in this case because any, this is coherent scattering, so any decoherence processes will reduce the reflectivity coefficient. And here's uh, the expression for how it looks like if I have pure dephasing in the system, so that's just a broadening of the zero phonon line, so that corresponds to very large, uh, very fast dephasing processes, but I can have all kinds of 
and I do have all kinds of decoherence processes. There can be spectral diffusion, that the line is, is flickering, uh, going back and forth uh, uh, on slow time scales. Uh, it can blink and, uh, and so on. And this is, as I, as I already mentioned, this is really where there has been very exciting progress, I think, in the field that uh, people have really started to overcome these decoherence processes. Uh, Meta Tatura, for instance, at Cambridge, um, uh, Richard Warburton and Basel have shown that we can get close to transform limited lines uh, from a single quantum dot. There will always be a little bit of phonon broadening, a phonon sidebands. So even at zero Kelvin, there will be probability to emit, spontaneously emit single photons. So that gives a little bit of phonon sidebands if you zoom in on the lines here. Uh, this is at the level of 5%, but, and we also know what determines that. We can actually control that ideally by controlling the quantum dot, uh, the size of the quantum dot wave function. Um, char so spectral diffusion, that is due to charge noise. All charges in the vicinity of the quantum dot roaming around will, 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 will give rise to spectral diffusion. And this has really been overcome uh, with quantum dots. This is what this work here shows. So we have uh, up to 95% emission in the zero photon line. Uh, we, people have demonstrated larger than 96% indistinguishable photons. Uh, and the tricks are really to do put gates on the structures and, and do resonant excitation uh, to, uh, to obtain this performance. So here are our first uh, data on the single photon observation of the single photon on linearity uh, with a quantum dot in a photonic crystal waveguide. So there we make all these uh, composite photonic crystal structures. We have a quantum dot sitting in a slow light photonic crystal waveguide section in order to have the high beta factor. And then we gradually change the lattice constant so that we go from a slow light section into well, what we sometimes call a fast light section where you don't have the, 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 the high group index. Because this fast light, you can better impedance match to a dielectric waveguide that you can better impedance match to a grading and that you can couple out with high efficiency. And then we have a transmission type experiment here where we are launching light on this grading, transmitting through the quantum dot and looking at the transmission from the other grading. And uh, well, these are uh, relative transmission uh, measurements when we are scanning the resonance of the laser through uh, the quantum dot resonance. And we see transmission dips here at the 8% level in this case. Best things performance we have seen is about 15%. Uh, limited so far by spectral diffusion, actually, uh, because we don't have gates on these structures yet. Yet, this is next generation experiments. Uh, so that will mean some jitter will, will really uh, mean that, that we don't get the beta squared performance that we ideally could expect in this case. If we measure the transmission here as a function of photon flux uh, or the power on the sample, so this is for a weak coherent state, we are seeing that, that uh, the nonlinear behavior here that levels off uh, or the, with a characteristic switching energy that corresponds to uh, less than one photon per lifetime of the emitter. Um, and um, so that's a saturation really at the single photon level. Um, and uh, we can also, from these uh, data and also the data I'll be showing on the next slide, we can actually determine the, the, the parameters really describing this uh, uh, responsible for this nonlinear response. So it will be the beta factor, it will be the pure dephasing rate, that's the broadening of the zero phonon line, and then it will, will be the spectral diffusion I was talking about. The spectral diffusion is something you should just get rid of. Uh, that's a sort of a trivial <laughs> uh, decoherence processes. That's just some. Um, some rubbish in your data, and again, these gates should should make sure that, that, that this is possible. So you have deconvoluted uh, the transmission response uh, without uh, the spectral diffusion. You see that what you could expect would be up to a 40% transmission dip in this case. The beta factor of this particular quantum dot was 88%, and we actually had some residual broadening of the zero phone line of 0.7 uh, relative to the uh, uh, radiative lifetime, uh, which is the limiting factor in what we're seeing here. I should also point out that, of course, there's a lot of work, we've heard about it already uh, from Edu and, and also from, from Kai, uh, of uh, nonlinearities with, uh, on cavity polaritons, where you're using the, the anharmonicity of James Cummings letter as a nonlinear medium, uh, so Imamoclus group as well, Pascal Sinela. Um, so what we're using here is the nonlinearity of the quantum dot. 
So we can also measure the photon statistics. So uh, then you should see this um, 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 this, this, this photon sorting going on, that the single photon uh, contribution will be reflected, and two and higher photon components will have increased probability to be transmitted. So as you see, photon bunching in the transmission, and this is also what we see, although modest 8% effect. This is very sensitive to pure defacing, it turns out. So observing this photon bunching is, uh, is, is I mean, uh, highly sensitive, uh, or shows that we are, that we are actually quite uh, coherent, uh, even though we don't have electrical gates in these structures. And we see this G2, uh, this bunching disappearing when we're increasing the power on the sample. And again, we have a deconvoluted response here if we overcome the, um, the spectral diffusion. Okay, so this was photon nonlinearities. Now, I'll tell you about another type of waveguides we have recently studied that we call glide plane waveguides. And this pretty much shows, uh, very much emphasizes the engineering potential of photonic crystals because it's a highly inhomogeneous structure. And there's all this freedom that you can choose, lattice constant, you can choose, you know, design a structure that does interesting things. And here we have designed a structure that gives rise to unidirectional emission. Um, so this can be used for, uh, for interfacing spins and, and photons and uh, spin-photon entanglement. Um, and the trick is really to, uh, the waveguides I was talking about before were uh, symmetric around the, um, um, around the plane here, around the waveguide plane. So if I, if I uh, you know, up, yeah, there's a mirror symmetry right around the waveguide plane. And an outcome of that is that, that the modes here are uh, primarily linearly polarized. So here you see the electric field, EX and EY, linear polarization components of the electric field in the photonic crystal waveguide. If I break this symmetry, I introduce what we call the glide plane symmetry, that you translate the upper half here by half a lattice constant. You change the polarization of the mode. So here we show the projections uh, on, an, on a right and left circular polar polarized uh, uh, basis. So EX plus I, EY, and you see that the modes here are preferably primar uh, primarily uh, circularly polarized. And this has important consequences because if I then put a circularly polarized emitter inside this photonic crystal waveguide, I place it at a position where the, where the local polarization is also circular. Then um, this emitter will actually emit along just one direction. If it, because it, its action is D dot E, so if the if the local electric field matches exactly the, the circular polarization of this emitter, it will just go along one direction because the, from reciprocity, E propagating along one direction and the one going the other direction is a complex conjugate of that. So that means if, if a perfect uh, interaction along one direction is orthogonal and, and therefore the interaction is zero along the other direction. So that's the idea about this chiral photon emission. If I put a sigma plus polarized emitter, and it matches exactly the same polarization, circular polarization in the waveguide, then I can get this emitter to decay to the, to, the, to the right, say, and have no emission to the left, and vice versa for sigma minus polarized emitter. Um, so this is a numerical simulation of this effect, and if we calculate, so how efficient is this? We can define the directional beta factor. What's the probability that my emitter uh, emits a photon in the direction that I'm interested in? That, that this emits to the, to, the, to the right, as opposed to emitting to the left or radiating out of the structure due to coupling to radiation mode. That's a directional beta factor. Well, the numbers here are up to 98%. So I could get a directionality, a deterministic directional emission, ideally. And I think, actually, we should be able to go to 100%. There's no reason why, um, I mean, I cannot engineer this to go very close to 100%. I think that's just an engineering challenge. So the experimental demonstration of this effect is that uh, you see here, again, a composite structure. You have a glide plane photonic crystal waveguide section that you see here where we have been, where we've broken this mirror symmetry. And then we actually, again, uh, adiabatically change this mode so that you can, uh, to, a, to a regular photonic crystal waveguide mode out here that you can couple out in a dielectric waveguide and you can collect light from two gradients here. Then we put, mag we identified single quantum lines, as you can see here. It's quadrant line A and quadrant B. And then we are putting a magnetic field 
on these quantum dots to split them and induce circular, in-plane circular polarization. And then you see for, for line B here, for instance, uh, red means I'm collecting it from the left grading, blue means I'm collecting it from the right grading, that, that the B plus, sigma plus polarized transition emits almost only to the left. I only collect a little bit to the right, the blue curve here, and vice versa for the, vice versa for the B minus. And, uh, and similar behavior for A plus, and I can then extract the directionality of this uh, single photon emission here, see the directionality as a function of magnetic field, and you see the numbers here up to about 90% directionality for line uh, B and, and somewhere uh, smaller for, for line A. We think this is actually limited by the, the way that we do this experiment. We did non-resonant excitation, so you see there's a little bit of grass in the spectra here. That means I cannot, uh, you know, have the you may, I don't see uh, the lines going all the way to zero. So I think, in reality, the directionality could be much higher. And we do some G2 measurements also here to show that this really single photon directional emission. I should point out there's also related work from, from a group in Sheffield um, um, where they're using uh, crossed uh, dielectric waveguides uh, to observe such a directional emission. So those are examples of unidirectional photonic reservoirs uh, that are becoming quite popular. Um, so uh, these photonic crystal light plane waveguides are one example. There's also all the beautiful work in Arno Rauschenbeutel's group, and we'll hear about that tomorrow. Um, so they are trapping atoms in the vicinity of, of um, tapered fibers, and, uh, and there they see also that, that these evanescent modes that you have there have a strong longitudinal component and that gives rise to this directional behavior as well. Um, and that's of course also here at Howard, Michel Lukin's group, uh, trapping atoms in the vicinity of photonic crystal uh, cavities and, and similar type of effects uh, would be expected there as well. It's another way of making one-sided system is of course just to take a one-sided cavity. Um, but you might also exploit this longitudinal component of the electric field, which we also call spin-orbit coupling of light to, to induce directionality. And you can do some, some funny things with such a unidirectional photonic reservoir. You can start to, to create non-reciprocal photonic devices, integrated photonic devices. Because if I make a Maxenda interferometer as indicated here, and I have a small glide plane waveguide section uh, in one of the arms, then if I send in two pulses, two photons, uh, one is uh, uh, resonant with a transition that can only emit to the left, and the other is non-resonant, well, then... Um, the transmission coefficient uh, for this situation is uh, 1 minus 2 beta directional. A single photon will not be reflected like we're used to due to this destructive interference between uh, scattered light and, uh, and, uh, and, and the illuminating light because this, scatter uh, this, this uh, direction is suppressed. So it can only go forward and it will acquire a pi phase shift in doing that. So that means if a blue photon comes in, it requires a pi phase shift, and it will go to, say, from, from, from down to down, while the red photon that is not resonant will go from down to up because of this pi phase shift that the blue photon acquires. That means if I go backward, the, the red photon is still non-resonant, so it will go from up to down, but the blue photon will also go from, will go from down to up because that's not interacting with the emitter anymore because it's uh, d dot e is zero as opposed to being optimum when propagating forward. So I'll actually have non-reciprocal behavior. The photon, blue photon, does end up in a different port than the, uh, the non-interacting photon. And, um, well, you can uh, think about making gates like this, uh, and there's not much new, I think, in, 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 this, in this gate. It's, it's a Duane Kimball uh, idea that we also heard from, from Edo about. It's a, it's a, but, but you can think of making a, a, a fully deterministic on-chip photon, photon C not gate based on this. And I think the new thing for, for an experimentalist like me would be that, that now I can really picture how I would get the photons in and what resources do I need in order to do that fully deterministically. Um, I can start to, to, to draw it and say, okay, I, I, I need three input ports here and I can send the, the control photon and target photon from two different directions. I don't need to split it up and, and do things because of the directionality. I do need to be able to also interact um, uh, deterministically with the, with the control photon. So that means that I'll be able to, I need to be able to switch this uh, max center parameter so that I go from, say, uh, sending the photon deterministically in here 
to having 50-50 beam splitters. So one resource that we will need is also adjustable or tunable beam splitters, and we're envisioning doing that with electromechanical uh, control of, uh, of, of photonic waveguides. Um, and I'll not go through it here, but this is called kind of the, the layout of, of this deterministic photon-photon uh, gate. How much time do I have? Okay. So I'll say a little bit about uh, photon sorting uh, because um, so this gate requires that we are applying uh, pulses on the we're controlling the, the spins inside the quantum dot and we are preparing coherent superposition like what Ido was talking about. It would of course be nice if I could do something just with passively scattering photons on a, a two-level system because that's extremely easy. I just use the quantum dot and the nonlinearity of the quantum dot as a passive scatterer. And this was uh, an idea, actually, continuation of uh, extension of, of, of proposals of, of Anas and, and, and Misha of, um, of trying to do photon sorting and, and trying to do it efficiently. This was something we did together with Tim Ralph at uh, UQ in, in, in Australia, that if I scatter uh, one and two photons, I scatter superposition of one of two photons, I might be able to separate those two components from each other uh, if I do it in a proper way. Thing is that I cannot just with a single scatter, I cannot just get the one photon to be reflected and the two photons to be reflected uh, perfectly. But I can do something else. If I choose the pulse width of the uh, of the mode properly, I can, in a single scattering event, um, create a situation where the two one and two photon components are in orthogonal spectral and temporal modes. I will distort the the, the pulse of uh, by by scattering, but I'm distorting it in such a way that one and two photons are exactly in orthogonal spectral temporal mode. So that means I should be able to, to, to distinguish them or to, to take them apart. But I need something than just more than just passive filtering because they are not, I mean, it's not just spectrally that they don't overlap. It's a spectral temporal mode that, that is orthogonal. But I can do such a separation by, for instance, some frequency generation. And there's a group in Paderborn in Germany that are really experts in doing that at single photon. So by level, so with, with high efficiency, super, <laughs> with high efficiency. So by tuning the, controlling the spectral temporal mode of the pump, you can uh, spectrally transduce um, the spectral temporal mode that you're interested in. So I could spectral, I could transduce the one photon component to the sum frequency and do nothing to the two photon component, and that mean I could split them by having just a dichroic beam splitter. So a two-level scatter combined with the sum frequency generation step would be a component that splits a one and two photon. Uh, components and uh, two photon parts of this beam uh, uh, very efficiently. And then uh, you can do things like bell state measurements, as, as, as Anas was also uh, proposing, but do it very re resource efficient in this case. Uh, just four of those events, uh, uh, those uh, single uh, two-level scatterers and, and some frequency generation steps implemented in a linear optic circuit should be sufficient to do deterministic bell state measurement. And you can even think about um, making an, a nonlinear sign gate, but in order to do that, you, will all, you really need to, to store the photon also. You need a quantum memory because you need to reverse the pulse distortion that you get uh, by scattering. All right, so this is, um, this is a legal slide uh, because summarizing what I think we are, we are doing in this field. Um, so we are building Lego blocks. We're not starting to put the Lego blocks together yet, so my kids were very disappointed that they learned that I do Lego at work, and they were excited, and then when I explained to them that we didn't even start to build, they were slightly less excited. So, <laughs> so I think we, are, we, are, we have been constructing these Lego blocks. We have these uh, single photon sources that are very high, very efficient. We can use them as a nonlinearity as well. We know how to improve the performance of, the, of them. And then there's really a lot of engineering uh, in order to couple the root the photons very efficiently because photonic crystals are very, very good for enhancing light matter interaction, but they're lousy for routing photons. So they're extremely lossy. You can propagate photons over 100 microns typically, and then you're, you're limited by fabrication imperfections that leads to endless and localization, things like that. We have studied that in, in lots of details. So you want to get out of the photonic crystal waveguides as fast as possible. And uh, this is an impedance matching task that you're engineering this interface from a photonic crystal structure to dielectric waveguides for doing your photon circuitry. That's really how you, 
are you, you don't want to compete with, with, uh, with dielectric waveguides uh, for routing or propagating photons. And then you can do your photon circuitry uh, based on standard dielectric waveguides. And uh, the superconducting nanowire detectors also are really coming along uh, that naturally can be integrated on such a platform uh, for highly efficient detection of photons. And of course, you can also start to do more quantum dots. And, and Edo was also talking about that. There are challenges, obviously, of overcoming inhomogeneous broadening and also doing tuning. And, and I think Edo uh, uh, pointed, pointed that out uh, uh, very well. I think another, uh, 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 an additional approach that you can take uh, in, instead of, of you know, the position growth, because one of the troubles there is really to what extent you can do that you can you can preserve the good optical properties really the 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 indistinguishability of this ninety six percent that I was talking about um, another approach would really be to optically identify these quantum dots. We can do that with very high precision. You can just optically go in and say there's a quantum dot with ten nanometer precision relative to a line mark and I can find another one, find another one, and then I say I want to couple free. this is my ambition. Well, then I can design a nanostructure that couples exactly those three. The nanostructure, the, the engineering potential of the nanostructure is extremely forgiving. Uh, that, that if I'm just you know, solving Maxwell's equations very seriously, I could see that I could couple, I mean, qubit for qubit, quantum dot for quantum dot, I could scale these systems. I think that's the approach that, that we, will, we will be trying. This is not a way of, then you still need electrical gates or, or, um, or um, um, strain tuning to, of course, overcome spectral diffusion. Nice thing of doing optical characterization first is that then you also can cherry pick them and say, okay, I like those three. They're, they're within a nanometer of each other. Um, this is a way of doing one, two, three, four, five. I don't see we can do hundreds, obviously, with a technique like that. But, but each of those would be deterministically coupled, uh, ideally. So, so I think that's a resource that we are striving to, to exploit uh, that, that becomes really a realistic um, resource in this field. I think I'll skip this part, which is about uh, that some of the physics, new physics that is also there in the, in the quantum dot systems that they might, and certain, I mean, they extended the emitters and don't have rotational symmetry, so that means that dipole approximation actually may sometimes breaks down in these systems. And we have observed this and understand this, this quite well, also microscopically what is going on. So I'll just conclude and say that I've talked about Photonic crystals, we can control spontaneous emission, but more generally we enhance the interaction between light and matter, a single photon and single quantum dot. We can have deterministic and highly directional single photon emission by engineering the photonic crystal to do that. I showed some first results on single photon on linear optics, and I talked something about these building blocks and, and, and architecture for scalable quantum networks that we are uh, pursuing. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the group that you see a picture of here, the Quantum Photonics Group and the Spore Institute. We're around 15 uh, researchers. Uh, and uh, I should acknowledge uh, our collaborator at KIST Korea for growth of quantum dots. And again, uh, refer you to the, this very modern physics paper where we are kind of uh, reviewing the stages of this field. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you have to control the position of the quantum dot, right? Yeah, that's true. But I, for, I forgot to mention that. Uh, the structure here is actually engineered also to have uh, many, sp to be spatially robust also. So that's, that's the idea behind the glide plane waveguide, that, that you see the spatial map here of the directional beads effect. So there are many spatial positions that have a high directionality. Even without the glide plane waveguide in a regular photonic crystal waveguide, there are also positions spatial position where you have a circular polarization where you also see this direction. That's completely true. Yeah. Um, I had a question when you showed the transmission data and the reduction of the yeah. transmission the um, I think I was a little confused because here I thought the, the, your claim was in part that the transmission doesn't go down that much because of spectral diffusion. Yeah. Oh, why, why would that suggest this? Well, G2 at times near zero shows you all the fluctuations in all three of the frequencies in the system. It's excess noise. Like usually, it's a kind of reasonably small spectrum. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, no, it's not, it's not ex excess noise due to spectral diffusion. The, the, this is something that, this is really the emitter, so it falls off no, with not it. Not at zero time, but at like 10 nanoseconds, let's say. I mean, yeah. Is, your, is the spectral diffusion, if it's you know, slow compared, if it's fast compared to 10 nanoseconds, yeah. then it should show up as a yeah. in the track. No, no, it's slow compared to 10 nanoseconds. Then it should show up as an offset. Yeah, yeah, so, so that, right, so there, there could be something on a, on a long time scale, yeah. That's, No, this is this is to the next pulse. You can say to the neighbor, to the neighbor to pulse that comes 13 nanoseconds later. No. There are excess no, but it's, but it's, no, but like on the positive what? side, this can be used as a goal. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. yeah. No, yeah. It's to, to, to know what one really means is powerful about what the noise yeah. is. Yes. Yeah. So regarding the transmission measurement, did you try on um, weak above band? This is with weak above band, actually, to get this performance. So, so this, this, this was actually quite a tour de force just to get this performance. Uh, so, and I think it's clear, I mean, you, you want gates in these structures too. Uh, I mean, you, you, you apply a weak above band field to try to passivate some of the surface uh, char traps, and traps and so on, but this is a dirty game. How, yeah, sure. Uh, I said it very briefly, but um, so let's see. Um, so we, you want to measure the, I mean, you measure the rate, the total decay rate, that's this guy here. So, so that would be uh, uh, the, you just direct, you get directly from the rate. The hard part is to, to get the uncoupled rate here, and that you search for quantum rods that are slow. And, but they have to sit in the waveguide, and we ensure that to do that by, by collecting light from the gradings. So that's to, I mean, if you're just measuring, it could be sitting outside the waveguide, and it could be sitting in the band gap reading. So you're looking for the slowest quantum dots that are sitting, uh, that are still coupled to the waveguide. So that means it will have a residual <laughs> coupling, uh, gamma WG as well. Uh, and that's a 0.1 inverse nanoseconds. That's the slowest on, on one that we get. And then you want to make sure that 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 the that, that what you the, the slow one that you measure the gamma non-guided rate is a typical is a is a fair is a good comparison to the gamma non-guided one that that the well-coupled quantum dot has. But we have and that you can actually you from from its rate that you measure you know you have you limit down the spatial position that you can sit at because we we have calculated the local density of states in the structure. And this is why we can say it's a lower bound of 98.4% because we know that, that we know that uh, kind of a, an upper bound of this gamma NG and we also know that there will be some residual gamma WG uh, because otherwise it wouldn't emit to the grading, it wouldn't collect light from it.